Okay, so today we're going to talk about research methods. Or I guess not necessarily today, maybe over the course of a few days, depending on how you watch these, whatever. Um, but anyway, this lecture, uh, which I'm probably going to break into at least two, uh, maybe three short lectures, uh, is going to be about research methods and clinical methods. There are some things that are similar between the two, and there are some things that are um, pretty different between the two. Um, and so we'll talk about the differences, but we'll also talk about um, the similarities. Before I get into any of it at all, I want to say that one of the similarities is writing. Uh, writing is absolutely important. No matter what you end up doing um, in this field uh, for your career, writing is going to be of absolute utmost importance. If you are an SLP, you're going to need to be able to write your case reports um, in a way that your people that you're working with can read them easily uh, and quickly and with understanding. If you are an AUD, basically the same story. If you're a researcher, uh, if you go the PhD route and do the research uh, realm like I do, we write up our findings into um, papers. So the research papers that you're finding um, for homework two, which uh, you just turned in, you know, that's all the kind of things that we do. Sometimes we also write books and chapters uh, and textbooks even. So uh, writing is not something that you're going to get away from no matter what realm you go into. Um, so it's definitely important. There are some resources that I put on the Canvas, uh, on Canvas. Um, there's Kale, chapters one through four. There, It's not long. Um, it's really short. That's one of the reasons why I like the Kale book. It's, it's tiny. Um, each chapter is about five pages at the most. Um, so take a look at that. It's not required for this section. You're not going to be tested over it. Um, it's just there to help you with your own writing. So uh, going forward, if there's um, another assignment in this class, which there will be one more assignment in this class, you might want to take a look at some of those. And certainly you're going to have more writing assignments in future classes and in other classes outside of this discipline. Take a look at that book. It has... Um, there's tips in there that um, I found useful. I mean, you. I, I don't know if I've told you in this class, but in some of the other classes I've talked about, I used to be uh, an English major uh, and do a lot of, uh, of writing classes. And so I knew a lot about writing. Um, but I was in graduate school and I first started using this Kale book, and there were some things in there that blew my mind with how easy uh, they were to uh, understand. So you can even have a really good grasp of um, the craft of writing and still learn something from this kale book. Um, if you look at those four chapters and you want um, the rest of the book, I think I can hook you up with a copy. We'll, we'll see. So anyway, let me know. Um, all right, so anyway, writing, it's important. I also have um, a PowerPoint up for tips and tricks and one for writing a really good introduction. Again, those two things are not required. You're not going to be tested over them. Um, they're just there for you, just resources for you to look at. Okay, let's talk about research methods. I'm totally going to nerd out on this because I love research. It's, it's one of my most favorite things of all time. Um, and maybe you get this uh, statistics joke and maybe you don't. That's okay. You will, maybe, by the end of this lecture, hopefully. So let's start with a quick, um, let me move my face. Well, it's, it's pretty much okay where it is. Maybe I can shrink it, hang on. Um, we're gonna start with a really quick uh, review of uh, statistics knowledge, which you're either taking concurrently with this class or maybe you've had it before. Um, so what if we want to look at the relationship between two things? Uh, well, that's a correlation, right? So we could say like, um, one of the silly, uh, examples that, um, 
that we always use in the statistics world is ice cream and murder. Ice cream sales and murder are correlated. Murder rates and ice cream sales are correlated, which uh, is interesting. <laughs> so you can look at, you know, throughout, uh, well, it doesn't, you can, you can measure, you know, how many, uh, how much ice cream is being sold and you can look at a city's murder rate. And um, there's a pretty decent correlation between how much ice cream is being sold and how many people are being killed. Um, and, of course, it doesn't mean that when people eat ice cream, they go insane and start murdering people. And it also doesn't mean that after, say, a serial killer kills somebody, then they're like, you know, I could really go for a nice cone of pistachio. Um, and it's actually pushed by a third variable, which is temperature. Um, so, of course, you're hot and you want ice cream. Um, and also, when you're hot, it increases your aggression, and so you end up with a lot more uh, murders in your city. Uh, so that's what's pushing this correlation. But essentially, what you have are two independent... Um, well, they're not necessarily independent. They can be related because of the correlation, but not necessarily related. But you have two different types of data. Right, and you want to see if there's some sort of relationship between the two. Is there a relationship between height and income, or something like that? Is there a relationship between ice cream sales and murder rates? Anything like that. You're going to look at that with a correlation. This graph right here shows different types of correlations. Remember, a correlation can go from 1 to negative 1. Uh, but that doesn't mean that a one correlation of one is stronger than a correlation of negative one. They're equally strong. So take a look at this right here. A correlation of zero means that there's nothing, there's nothing going on, right? These two things are not related to each other. You can get a correlation of zero with a bunch of totally wacky patterns. Um, but essentially what you're looking for is like one does not predict the other. So if you're moving from this act, this uh, zero point right here and trying to draw a line between all these, you can't say that ice cream sales, which is over here, um, is related to murder rates. One does not move with the other one, right? It's this really weird wavy pattern or it's a square or it's a diamond or it's another smaller wave. Typically what you're going to see, these are all like ridiculous examples, those really shouldn't even be there. Typically what you're going to see is something like this, um, just like a bleh, like a blob, um, and that would show you that like these two things are not correlated. There's absolutely nothing going on, there's no way that two things are correlated, and that's zero. So zero means no correlation. One means there is a very strong correlation, and negative one means there is a very strong correlation. How, then, why do we have a positive one and a negative one? Well, it just tells you about the way that they're related. So ice cream sales and temperature are correlated with something that's positive. Not necessarily one. That would mean that for every temperature increase, there is a murder. Or for every additional ice cream a unit being sold, there's a murder. It's a one-to-one -one ratio, which certainly it's not. It's probably something more like this, where there's like a really messy um, correlation between the two. You wouldn't expect a really, uh, really great um, ratio between the two, but it's positive. More ice cream being sold, more murders happening, so it's moving up, um, and you get this one-to-one -one ratio. Am I? Oh, it's flipping my video, I see. Or it's not flipping my video, I'm just doing it from my viewpoint. So, for you guys, it'd be moving this, this way. <laughs> there we go. Um, and then a negative one would be, uh, I don't know, let's see, um, coat sales and ice cream sales. That seems to make a lot of sense. So as people start buying more coats, it's probably colder, which means they're probably buying less ice cream. And I mean, look, I don't know about you. I like ice cream at any temperature. It seems a little like maybe that wouldn't really work to me, but whatever. Anyway, 
um, that would be a negative correlation because more of one ends up predicting less of the other one. And a positive, more of one predicts more of the other one. So if you were looking at a correlation of 0.6 and negative 0.8, which one's stronger? Negative 0.8 is stronger. The negative is just telling you what direction it's going. So really you're looking at the magnitude from 0 to 1. The absolute value of 0 to 1 is telling you what's stronger. The sign is just telling you what direction that correlation is. Hopefully that's a review, but uh, you might see these kind of ideas on a question or two in the exam. Okay, so what if, and we're going to move on to a different type of um, statistical test, basically. Well, really quickly, you might wonder, like, well, why the heck are we talking about these statistical procedures before we talk about research methods. I will tell you why. Because when you're doing research, what you're doing is you're trying to get numbers. You're trying to prove something. Uh, or you're trying to illustrate something. You're trying to illustrate that there is a relationship between two variables, which would be a correlation. Or you're trying to illustrate that there's a difference between two uh, numbers, like some training procedure and people who didn't get that training procedure. And that's a different kind of test. So you kind of have to know what difference you're expecting to be able to set up your experiment the right way. If you want to look at a correlation, if you want to see if two things are related, really all you need to do is come up with surveys or some sort of test that will give you a number for those two things. Then you can correlate them. If you want to see if there's a difference between some new um, therapy that you've come up with, a new speech therapy, say a new uh, way to control your uh, disfluencies, you take that and you can have people who don't get that um, procedure or they get a different one, whatever the most common one is um, at that time. So you can pair yours against a different procedure. You can even have a third group of no procedure at all and then you can test the differences between those means. But you have to know what kind of data you're expecting to set your research up in the right way. I should also mention that I say that uh, you go the PhD route to do research. That is true. We mostly focus on research and teaching, but you do not have to have a PhD to do research. There's a lot of people with master's degrees who do research, uh, especially in our department. Um, and really, you know, people with just bachelor's degrees, um, students uh, can also be involved in research as well. You typically need um, a faculty member or somebody with a PhD to like push the research through the IRB component, but certainly uh, everyone can be involved in the research process. So if you have an idea before you graduate or even right after you get your SLPA certificate, research can still be done. Okay, so what if you want to test, like we we're talking about, difference between two things? Um, training procedure A, training procedure B. Well, when you're comparing differences uh, in means or differences in groups, that's going to be uh, something like a t-test or an ANOVA. So you're comparing the means. And then the last type, this one is more difficult, so it's probably going to be uh, the one that's like least on your radar, which is fine. Um, you want to see what contributes to an overall score. So let's say uh, wages. That's a great one. So wages at work. We know that, uh, you know, unfortunately women get paid uh, 74 cents to um, every dollar that a man is paid. Um, that just, you know, seems to be uh, true. Um, it shouldn't be, but it, it is. Um, and so one thing that we can do is we can look at what people are being paid. Now, you could take a look at all of the salaries for men, and you can take a look at all the salaries for women, and you can compare them, and you can say, like, ah, oh, there's a difference here. That would be a t-test and an ANOVA again. However, there could be other factors that contribute to that. So let's say how long you've been with the company. 
what position you hold, um, your educational background, um, all sorts of things like this. Uh, how many hours uh, a week you work? Are you salary or not? All, all sorts of things like this. What you can do is you can put all of these factors in, um, like gender, age, how long you've been with the company, uh, your, your edu years of education, something like this. And then you can figure out how much each one of those contributes to salary. So you can figure out that going from male to female accounts for this much of a jump. And you can figure out that each additional year of education beyond a bachelor's degree accounts for this much of a raise in salary. Um, and so what you might uncover is, let's say that you compared um, male salaries to female salaries and you didn't you found a slight difference but one, it wasn't quite significant once you account for all these other factors maybe there's a lot of um, men that are like not as far in their career but they're getting paid more than they should be so there's women that are further in their career that are getting paid you know a, a decent amount these uh, men are just hired a couple of years ago and they're making somewhere close to the same amount. So it might look like there's not a difference, but when you control for these other things, suddenly there is the same difference that we see um, typically. So that is a different kind of thing. That's called regression. Again, this one, it's harder to set up. Um, it's usually not, you know, typically used. Uh, I mean, it's used a lot. I shouldn't say that. It's just not typically used by people who aren't like really into research, right? But the other two are correlation and a t-test or an ANOVA, just comparing means or seeing if there's a relationship between the two things. Very useful. They're easy to understand too. Um, so I think that there are things that would be useful for you to know if you decided that you wanted to do some research. And I mean, here's the other thing. When you're, when you're doing clinical work, you will start to begin to see things like, oh, when I do this with this person, with this child or, or adult or a very old person, whatever, um, they seem to understand the concept I'm teaching them, but when we do it this way, it doesn't work as well. And you may start to wonder, like, the next person I see, I'm going to try it that way too and see if they get it better. And this could be like a research study. I mean, this is something that you might want to tell other people and you could you could say like well look anecdotally when I do it this way it works a lot better or you could do it with research you could you know go and move this into a different kind of uh, like out of the anecdotal evidence and actually do a research study and have some people who get trained one way and some people get trained the other and then you wouldn't just be saying like well when I do it it seems like these people that get this treatment are better you can actually say, like, we have data that shows that this treatment is superior to the other, so you should do it this way. And it can help a lot more people. Uh, beyond that, you can publish it as a paper, and then people that you don't even know might start using your method. Okay, so what is the main crux of research? The main crux of research. What do you need to do to come up with a good research question a good research question actually i shouldn't say that a research question in general not just good but to be a research question it has to be falsifiable what that means is you have to be able to have a result where you can say no that didn't work a good research question might be something that is feasible but also it has to also be falsifiable. So we'll talk about the difference between falsifiability and feasibility in like two seconds, like starting right now. So um, we will start this with Bigfoot. Um, there's a lot of, uh, it's not, that's not necessarily true. There are people, not necessarily a lot. There are people who think the Bigfoot is real, um, but the ideas of what, Bigfoot is differ between these two groups of people. Um, some people think that Bigfoot's like the coelacanth. If you don't know what the coelacanth is, it's this fish. This fish is like this creepy looking dinosaur, uh, kind of like a skeleton-y looking creepy fish. Um, 
we found fossils of the coelacanth for uh you know years we dig them up and we thought it was something that had gone extinct like you know 20,000 years ago or or more something like that um and the scientific opinion was that it was dead right it had gone extinct and then somebody found one in like the 70s or 80s they just like pulled it up and they're like oh weird what kind of fish is this and some marine biologist was like it's a coelacanth there's no way um so now we know that they're um actually alive so some people think that a bigfoot is like a coelacanth there's like some ape-like thing that you know is around they think it's one of those early uh human ancestors that we do have fossils of who actually has gone on to survive this is falsifiable it's not necessarily feasible but it is falsifiable so one thing you could do is you could go to the forest where people say that these things are and you could get a whole bunch of people and you could canvas the forest and they could walk through i'm talking like tons of people like the entire population of oregon can get together and just walk through the forest and they would either find a bigfoot or they wouldn't and so if your research question was or your hypothesis is another word for your research question if your hypothesis is there's a bigfoot in this forest right here in oregon you could get all these people and they could canvas the forest like they do when they look for dead bodies on you know tv shows where they walk uh like six feet apart good for social distancing um and they just keep walking in a straight line and so then they can't miss something that is in the forest around them so if they did this and there was a bigfoot they'd find it and if they did this and there wasn't a bigfoot they would not find it it's a falsifiable question it's a crazy premise that even there is a bit it's crazy that even you might think that there is a bigfoot but it is a falsifiable question then there are people who think that bigfoot is an interdimensional being and if you canvassed the forest in oregon and you didn't find it they would say like oh well he jumped in his portal and he went over to china then that's not falsifiable you know it's just it's not even a research question you can't investigate something that's not falsifiable um there you can put this into the realm of like things that actually happen as well um and i think that possibly there are some other um, psychologists who might get upset with me for this one but um the freudian psychotherapy school which isn't used much anymore most people have figured out that it's bs so there's not a whole lot of people who buy into this because it's it's fake right um but they think that some personality disorders are caused by childhood traumas that are then repressed but then they manifest themselves uh as like you're an anal retentive person or you're a something else like any of these things like the Oedip the oedipus complex like all this kind of crazy stuff that this is all like things that happened in your childhood then you repress them but the way that your personality is comes from these repressed things that you don't even remember it's not falsifiable why is it not falsifiable because you can have freud say like oh you act this way you're anally retentive which meant that as a baby you enjoyed not pooping which is what that means um and you don't remember it there was some trauma that made you not want to poop or something like that but that's what it is and you can't prove whether that's true or not you can't prove that there was some trauma because you have repressed it and maybe it was something that you know other people in your family didn't know about or that they're lying about or something like this but it's there then because you act this way it must be there not falsifiable it's not it's not real <laughs> you can't research it and if you can't research it it might as well be fake right like there's if you can't phrase it in a way that you can find an untrue answer then all you can get is some sort of true answer and that means it's not science it's not capable of being researched now 
there are, we know that there are psychological disorders. Uh, so if we go at it a different way, not a psychotherapy way, we think that some psychological disorders are caused by uh, real identifiable trauma. Yeah, this is totally falsifiable. People have PTSD. I mean, this is from trauma. People have been in war. They've been in car accidents. They've been in natural disasters. They have fallen off of a ladder and gotten hurt very badly. All of these things, depending on how bad the trauma is, physical or psychological or both, um, can cause, you know, actual psychological disorders. And that's real. We can also research it because we can identify where this point of trauma was and we can ask the person and other people that they know, what did they act like before? What do they act like after? What's different? Obviously something happened. And you can track this through multiple people and that's how we figure out that something like PTSD is, a, is true, is a real thing. Um, so anyway, falsifiability is the main thing that we look for for a research question. It has to be falsifiable. Oh yeah, well, okay, so this is something I usually do um, when we do an in-person class, which isn't necessarily going to work in this lecture. But um, we're going to talk about this for homework three. Uh, I guess I'll just tell you right now, um, there's going to be more information on Canvas. But essentially what I want to do is I want to know uh, what you guys found out for homework two. I mean, I already know, I looked at your papers, but I also want other people in class to know as well. So usually in the in-person class, what I have you do is tell me the question that you had that was still remaining in the research. So like if you were doing something on ASD, uh, you might say like, you know, what uh, effect would COVID-19 getting it in a certain trimester have on a baby? Would it increase ASD? Would it do something else? We don't know. It's an absolutely interesting question. It's it's not exactly phrased in a falsifiable... Well, it is phrased in a falsifiable way, because like, what effect does it have? The effect could be nothing, or the effect could be definitely something. Um, so that is falsifiable. So usually I ask what what you found, what was your question, what was an interesting thing that you wanted to know more about that doesn't exist in the research. So this time, what I'm going to have you do is I'm going to have you make one single PowerPoint slide or uh, whatever the Google version of PowerPoint is, slides, so a slides slide, um, or whatever kind of thing like that you want to make, and tell us what you looked at what you found and what your question was and that's your final homework your final homework is that and your final homework is um, also watching the other uh, everybody else in the classes um, slides uh, and then if you see one that you really like or um, you know have make some sort of comment on that so uh, anyway more more info on that later Okay, let's, uh, you know what, let's call it right there for this um, lecture, and um, we'll start up the next one in, well, whenever you want to, I'll start up the next one in like two seconds. <laughs>